Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming back, nearly on time. We had an extremely interesting debate this morning, and now we move into the afternoon session, Farming Delivers for the Economy. I just want to point out that Lord Plum was taken to hospital after the morning session. He wasn't feeling too well. We wish him all the best. He's gone for a checkup. Let us hope our thoughts are with him. Let's hope he'll be joining us this evening for dinner. I'll quickly introduce the top table first of all. On my left we have Andy Robinson, our Director General at the NFU, Mr Philip Clark, Chief Executive of Tesco, Joanne Denny Finch of the Institute of Grocery Distribution, Mr John Cridland from the CBI, Peter you know, and Adam who was introduced this morning. So we'll have the three presentations and then I will open it up for questions. I've got an awful long list of questions here and obviously we see how time dictates, but it gives me great pleasure to first of all introduce Mr. Philip Clark, Chief Executive of Tesco. It's an extremely opportune time to have this discussion on what farming can deliver for the economy. But Philip was appointed Chief Executive of Tesco's in 2011. Philip commenced his career in a Tesco store, I believe, in Liverpool in 1974. You've aged exceedingly well, Philip. <laughs> After graduating with a degree in economics, he then joined the Tesco Management Training Programme, and I believe in 2004, Philip took over the control of overseas, the overseas business of Tesco. As I say, over the last two years, he has been the chief exec of Tesco Global. Philip, please give us Thank your you. presentation. Well, thank you very much, Marig, for that introduction. The theme of this conference, Farming Delivers in Uncertain Times, is a sentiment that I couldn't agree more with. It's uh, an appropriate title because I think the NFU, under Peter's leadership, is both an organization that delivers and it's a powerful and effective voice for you, for its members. It's my pleasure and honor to be invited here today. And it's also a very timely moment to be addressing your conference. So thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Not since BSE has the meat processing industry been under such scrutiny. The events of the last six weeks have shocked the whole country. Customers don't like what they've been hearing about some of the meat that's put on the plates they feed to themselves and to their families. So you'd expect me to use today's speech to address the very serious issues which have arisen, and I will. But I also want to talk about the huge opportunity which exists, not to just regain any trust lost over the last six weeks, but to create a supply chain which customers can understand and they can have confidence in. So today I'm going to announce some new commitments that Tesco is making to UK farming. Some are immediate commitments that we've been working on for some months. Some are going to take a little longer. Tesco customers tell me that they're concerned about the provenance of their meat and that they want to buy British. And the vision I have is of a bright future for British agriculture, a future based on better relationships and upon a more transparent supply chain. We're the UK's biggest retailer. We're the biggest customer of UK agriculture. And I firmly believe that means we should be the best supporter of British farmers. I think events over the last six weeks have been a wake-up call for the whole industry. Over many years, the way retailers source food has been allowed to become too complex. Reducing this complexity is in everyone's interest, specifically by shortening the supply chain where possible and increasing cooperation between the producers, the processors, and the retailers. What that complexity in the supply chain has also done is leave open to exploitation by rogue elements operating in the processing industry. 
So I'm here today at what is a pivotal moment for the industry. I think it can also become a transformational moment. A strong and dynamic food industry needs real partnership between retailers, between processors, and between farmers, underpinned by a very powerful and effective regulatory regime. The issues that have been making the headlines are not Tesco specific. There's barely a major retailer in the UK which is not to withdraw a product. And the problem extends beyond retail to the catering industry, beyond the UK, and across the European Union. But we can't hide behind the breadth of that challenge. I'm absolutely clear that as the market leader in the UK, it's our responsibility to lead the way out of this crisis. Over recent years, we've already made our first steps towards a new model of a relationship with some of the farmers that we work with. I'm very proud of what we've done to help our liquid milk farmers. Six years ago, the Tesco Sustainable Dairy Group was established to address the huge uncertainty that our milk farmers face as a consequence of volatility in the markets. And so long before last year's dairy crisis, we committed to pay our farmers a price above the cost of production, ensuring that the business turned a profit so they can plan and invest for a shared future. It's fair to say this initiative was launched to some skepticism, but it's proved to be a game-changing move, one that provided much needed stability for our farmers and represented a genuine commitment on our part to building a mutually supportive relationship with dairy farmers. In the autumn, we took this one step further. Beyond dairy, where we offered direct contracts to farmers who, prepare, who were prepared to supply Aberdeen Angus beef and fresh pork. These direct contracts will be overseen by a committee of farmers with the express aim to develop a new spirit of partnership and to offer them the certainty of a fair deal financially. That's a £25 million investment for us. It means we can now pay beef farmers a premium price above the market for their meat and offer pork farmers a cost directly linked to the price of animal feed, a major concern for many and therefore one for us too. So we've made a start. But events over the past month have reinforced my conviction that we need to move faster and to try harder. I'm happy to confirm already that all of our beef, whether it's fresh, frozen, or in our ready meals, is already from the British Isles. And today, I'm announcing a sincere commitment to source more of our meat closer to home. Where it's reasonable to do so, we'll source from British producers. And I invite the NFU and the wider industry to work with us to increase UK capacity for the production of meat and of poultry. As a first step, I announce that from July, all of our fresh chicken must come from UK farms. No exceptions. We'll move over time to ensure that all of our chicken in all of our products, fresh or frozen, is from the British Isles. Now, now, these commitments represent a genuine shift in how Tesco sources the products that we sell. But we can't do it without you. And so this needs to be a true and a sustainable partnership, one built on mutual trust and understanding, one in which both parties can prosper and make a fair profit. I think the processes are going to need to work with us in tripartite partnerships. They shouldn't become a barrier to Tesco and farmers talking and working directly together. I'm determined now to build a clear and a sustainable relationship of equals, and one which gives our customers confidence in how their food is produced. That has to be good for all of us in this room and all of us in the country. What we're gonna to work to do is to achieve transparency transparent relationships with our suppliers, 
transparent relationships with our customers. To achieve that transparency in the supply chain, we're therefore undertaking a root and branch review of how it works. So you might be wondering, what does that all really mean? It means we're going to examine all aspects of our supply chain. We're going to look at the processes that we use and make sure we can be totally confident in how our products are being sourced. We're proud of our high standards, but we're challenging every aspect of the supply chain to see how they could be more robustly applied where necessary. I'm in no doubt that we're going to find things that we don't like, but when we find them, we'll change them. Let me assure you, we will accept nothing but the very highest standards in our supply chain. Working directly with farmers and growers is key to the new approach. And so as well as making commitments about the provenance of our meat, I want to make some commitments to how we work with you. You've told us how powerful and helpful you've found our existing Tesco sustainable farming groups. They've proved a successful model for partnership with some of our dairy farmers. So today I announced the extension of these across our agricultural supply base to cover all proteins. We'll also explore the potential to extend this approach to fruit growers, to vegetable and to salads too. Furthermore, we're appointing a new Tesco agricultural director who will have the role of leading the development of these groups, but will also ensure for the farming industry a single point of contact with Tesco. You see, we recognize that if we're to have a genuine partnership with you, we need to give you the certainty you need to maintain and grow your business. And so again, and as a demonstration of our commitment to building this new spirit of collaboration, I'm committing Tesco to offer contracts with a minimum period of two years to all of our suppliers who want them. Thank you. I'm also announcing today that we're going to extend our very successful producer network. It's a social network of producers to help all of us share knowledge and communicate more directly with producers, with farmers, and with growers. We'll do this in a phased approach, starting next month with dairy farmers. I think it's a really exciting further step on the journey towards a true partnership with you. And it needs to be a true partnership, as we're only as good as the products we sell. The products that you produce the products our customers feed their families. I say we because we're not three distinct groups, farmers, retailers, and customers. We're interconnected, we're interdependent, and ultimately we're the responsibility of everyone in this room to deliver that partnership. Tesco's success over the past few decades is built on a focus on the customer and I'm committed to ensuring that our entire product range offers quality. This applies as much to our everyday value range as it does to our finest range. I'm never going to accept the patronizing argument that somehow a value product shouldn't meet the exacting standards of the core range. I'll also never accept the equally patronizing view that providing people with affordable food what some people dismiss as cheap food, is somehow wrong. It does not follow that the measures I'm announcing today mean that food needs to become more expensive. I can assure you that everyone at Tesco is committed to offering the highest quality food at every price point. Whatever a customer is able to afford, there can be no compromise. What's on the pack, and only what's on the pack, is what will be in the product. That's why I've put in place an industry-leading raft of measures to restore consumer confidence in our products. We'll be implementing an unprecedented DNA testing program on all batches of processed beef that come into our supply chain. And we're putting in place a new Tesco standard so shoppers can know that the products they're buying have been through the most rigorous testing regime in UK retail. 
To hold us to account, I also announced today that we're establishing an independent panel of experts who will help us to improve the way the supply chain works in practice. Now, I've emphasized the importance of communicating and of sharing information with you. But if we're to have a truly transparent supply chain, we need to share the same level of information with all of our customers. Today's connected customer expects to be able to find out everything about the products on the shelves, what's in it, where it was produced, and how it helps them make informed choices about their diet. Well, we've been communicating with our customers. You know, we've been acting immediately when we found problems, and we've been ensuring our customers have been kept informed in a timely fashion. But this intense focus on communicating with customers is not just about weathering the storm. The age of the internet, the growth of social media, enables us to have a much closer, a much more personal dialogue. And that will mean the ability for customers to have unprecedented levels of insight into what's in their food, things never seen before in the UK, and helping them understand how much care and attention we all take to the food that ends up on their plate. We'll use video to open up the supply chain. We'll enable our customers to trace every step of the journey from farm to fork. And that journey should now be much shorter. By shorter, I don't necessarily mean that the products we sell will invariably come from the farm down the road because that's not the way the world works. It's just not possible. But I do mean shorter in terms of links in the chain. It does not make the product better for our customers. That link will go. Every link puts distance between you and us. So we want that to be shorter. The commitments I make today are, are genuine. And I expect to be held to account for them. That's why I'm setting up that independent oversight panel I mentioned earlier. And you are our partners, and you will spot very quickly if a commitment we make proves to be hollow. I expect you to test us, and I expect you to tell me if we're not delivering. As Myrig explained, I grew up in Tesco, um, and I'm enormously proud of the company. But I also know that we haven't always approached our relationships with our farmers and our producers in the true spirit of partnership. I've come here today to acknowledge that and to tell you that we are committed to changing for the better. In summary, we've put in place better controls. We'll bring food closer to home. We'll build better relationships with you, our nation's farmers. Taken together, this amounts to the most radical change between a retailer and a producer that's been attempted. I'm certain it can work. So I offer today the hand of partnership, a partnership between you, between Tesco, and our customers, a partnership based on transparency, a partnership which can transform the offer for our customers. Join me in it. Thank you very much. Can I say on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for that presentation, Philip. You don't need, I don't need to tell you the anger and frustration that has been in the farming industry over the last four to six weeks. It's been a very difficult period for all of us. And coming here today, as you have, it was like walking into the lion's den. I think you've done exceedingly well and you've earned the respect of the audience. And I'm delighted to see that you're looking forward be talking about a more transparent supply chain, shortening that supply chain and taking out some of the complexity that we have seen over the last couple of weeks. Delighted to hear you say how you're leading the way out of this disaster over the past few weeks. And again, the commitment to more partnership working across the whole industry. And again, extremely good news for the broiler industry, for the fresh chicken industry. Again, they can look forward to that commitment of 100% UK produced. And can I say from an NFU point of view, Philip, we are determined to work closely with you and your teams to build a fair and equitable and a transparent partnership going forward. 
It has to be sustainable, and when I talk about sustainability, I mean economic sustainable as well, versus producers. And if you are setting up that independent panel of experts, there are some extremely good professional people within the NFU who could help you with that as well. So. <laughs> So, thank you and thank you very much for coming along today. Now it gives me great pleasure to call on Joanne Denny Finch. And again, as I say, the events of the last few weeks have knocked the confidence, not just of farming, retailers, processors, but also consumers. We have invited Joanne to speak because there is nobody better placed than Joanne to give us an insight to what shoppers and customers are thinking, what can be done to restore the confidence that is required right across that supply chain. IGD has been facilitating food industry discussions that have involved DEFRA, the National Farmers Union, and the whole supply chain, and acting as a barometer of shoppers' sentiment. Can I say, Joanna is an extremely good friend of the National Farmers Union, and we are indebted for the support you've given us over the years. Joanne, over to you. <coughs> Thank you very much for a warm welcome. We should all be passionate about consumers and earning their trust is paramount. Without this, we are nothing. Alongside our day job, we're all consumers too. And we all know how it feels to be let down. And that's how millions of people feel about their food right now, let down by the whole system. Now that might sound unfair, but it's a reality. We all get judged by the lowest common denominator. Farmers and growers have worked so hard for so long to raise food standards, so you'll have been dismayed by the last few weeks. As a great philosopher once said, Regard your good name as the richest jewel you can possibly possess. For all of us working in food, that jewel has been tarnished. But all is not lost, and our reputation can be repaired. I'll go even further. This could present a great opportunity. As any good business would say, and you'll know, if you deal with a complaint or a problem in the right way, you can win a loyal customer for life. So that should be our objective now. Serve our consumers better than ever before. Exceed their expectations. Strengthen their feelings of loyalty. The whole chain will need to work together on this. It's not a job for farming alone but you will play a vital part, and you can emerge all the stronger. I'm going to talk about the damage to consumer trust, what it means for farming, how we can rebuild confidence together, turning a difficulty into a great opportunity. We all know that trust can only ever be built gradually, and yet, it can be lost in an instant. It's closely linked with other words like expectation, guarantee, dependence, reliability, assurance, integrity, all ways to describe the bedrock of any good business or any good supply chain. It also underpins a healthy relationship between parties working together. And my hope is that recent events can also be a springboard to strengthen trust right the way through the, the food chain. The biggest food testing program ever undertaken anywhere in the world is now underway. So far, it's revealed only a handful of affected items, a tiny proportion of 25,000 food products sold in an average large supermarket. But even a handful is definitely too many. It's been a shock that's shaken everybody's confidence. IGD has a long heritage 
of consumer and shopper research. And through our Shopper Vista service, we listen to 12,000 shoppers each year. We've been tracking their trust in food for a long time. Normally, the trust of British shoppers has been high for food safety, quality, consistency, and authenticity. But from the middle of January, this began to drop. And two weeks later, it had fallen to the lowest level we've seen in a decade. Last weekend, it did begin to pick up, but there's a long way to go, and trust is still very fragile. The good news is there's no lack of confidence in British farmers. We've just repeated our question from four years ago. This was to find the most trusted professions. And from a list of 14, 14 farming remains in third place, just behind healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry. But the bad news is that confidence has been dented in all food, and you can't be detached from that. The greatest hit has been to trust, is trust in processed beef products, followed by meat sourced internationally, and any food with a large number of ingredients, ingredients. But nothing escapes unscathed. We've seen some dramatic swings in shopper demand. Sales of frozen burgers were badly dented, not least because many were cleared from the shelves. On the other hand, sales have been up for fresh beef, lamb, pork, fish. Local butchers have enjoyed a surge and farm shops, and no surprise, sales of corn were up by 10% in January. But at some stage, the market will settle. Much more important will be the lasting impact on the image of British food. The signs are encouraging. Even before this year, people were becoming more interested in the origin of their food. 78% of shoppers say it's important whether or not that their food comes from Britain. And that's up from 55% over six years ago. Almost eight in 10 shoppers agree that British farmers deserve the full support of the public. And dare I say, even that the England rugby team might not have quite as much support, and certainly not in your part of the world, Moirig. Had to get that in. More than eight in ten shoppers believe Britain should be more self sufficient in food, with a similar number saying your customers ought to focus more on selling British food. Food companies pick these messages up from their own research too, so, source from Britain is becoming more and more prominent in their marking. But that is not to deny the benefits of trade. Just as British farmers want to share in growth of big emerging countries, shoppers still want a choice of the very best from around the world. And their loyalty to British food in theory, as you know, doesn't always translate into practice when they're in a hurry in store. So British farmers will always have to stay competitive on quality, and on price. And you do have a strong hand, but the key right now is to play it very skillfully. In particular, you'll need to avoid several other traps ahead, particularly as we journey towards total transparency. Last month's events are just one window on a much bigger picture. Trust in all its forms of authority has been falling. We ask shoppers to name any industry they trust to do the right thing, and only 48% could think of one. And that's down from 60% four years ago. So everybody right now is wrestling with their reputation. And with food so essential, we'll always be at the sharp end. Joseph Hall, a 17th century bishop, of all people, put it very well. He said, a reputation once broken may possibly be repaired, 
but the world will always keep its eyes on the spot where that crack was. The eyes remain upon us and the media is hungry for more scandals. Consumers want answers to some very searching questions. Is there anything else in their food that shouldn't be there? Does food really come from where the label claims? Does all food sold under assurance schemes really apply the standards? And are companies on top of everything in their supply chains, including animal welfare, working conditions, and the environment? DNA and isotope testing have changed the rules of the game. The first is a forensic technique able to detect, to detect adulteration at tiny trace levels. The other can pinpoint a product's precise origin. Everybody is stepping up their testing now, including some of the media. So we're under unprecedented scrutiny, even more than we're used to already. And that means you can't dismiss horse meat as somebody else's problem. The ripples reach out to affect everyone who produces food. I am confident that the food chain will stand up well to this scrutiny. In Britain, we routinely have some of the most rigorous testing and auditing systems in the world. The Irish and the UK authorities were the first in Europe to identify the problem and the response was decisive. People regularly travel to the UK to study and learn from us. And yet, life under the spotlight will be uncomfortable at times, and we will need to raise our bar even higher. So consumer confidence has been damaged, and people need our reassurance. Consumers have a high opinion of British farmers, giving you a chance to build their loyalty even further. And everyone working in food is under even closer scrutiny. So what do we need to do next? We can't make our final conclusions until all the evidence is collected. We need to know exactly how the horse meat incident happened before we can decide what to do differently and how to prevent it from happening again and no stone should be left unturned. But already, we can set out the principles we need to apply to rebuild consumer confidence. First and foremost, we must put consumer interests first, as we always should. It's not just the right thing to do. It's also a really good investment. Retailers and manufacturers are obsessive about it, and the ones who do it best are invariably winners. Some farmers are really good at it too, helping them to build some fast-growing brands. It means going the extra mile to listen to what consumers have to say, taking their comments on board without being defensive, responding to their needs and concerns, and then informing everybody about what you've done. And now's the time to step this up. So if you only remember one of my principles, please make this the one. Put consumers at the heart of everything you do. But what about transparency? I say, let's welcome it. Although I did mention some of the traps earlier, I still believe transparency is one of British farming's greatest potential assets. Whenever a shopper connects with the farmer who produced their food, it makes that product feel special and different. It can set you apart from those working to lower standards, making food into less of a commodity. Real transparency means laying yourself completely open. The photos of farmers we often see today in our stores are a start, but they're only a start. With more shoppers taking their smartphones into shops, retailers are investing in Wi-Fi and more screens in stores that can show video. Transparency is coming to life in ways that Philip was talking about just now.
And here are some examples already in place from other countries. In Austria, shoppers can trace every Aldi organic product back to the farm through their phones. In the US, over 400 brands and retailers use the Harvest Mark system. Shoppers can scan a code on the label to see the grower, the farming method, the animal field regime, and so on. And in Canada, which is my particular favorite, something I saw last year, you can trace the fish you buy from a store or a restaurant, back to the boat, the time, and the place where it was caught. And that particular scheme is managed by the Canadian fishing industry because they know that it encourages shoppers to buy local. So I would be knocking down the doors of your customers to work together on this. This is an ideal way to rebuild confidence and provide evidence of a chain that is under full control. Principle number three is to make the biggest splash possible with every good news story you have. Facts and figures are good, but stories are even better. And farming has so many great stories to tell. Something extraordinary happened to farming a few years ago when the TV executives suddenly woke up and realized that farming was actually quite sexy. And Farmville, playing at being a farmer, was at one point the world's most popular game on Facebook. But there's still no let up in this appetite. 45% of shoppers tell us they'd like to hear more from farmers, with only 4% saying they hear too much. So there's an open invitation. The NFU has taken a lead through national campaigns, and these are even better when they're reinforced at local level. Leaf's Open Farm Sunday is a powerful way to showcase some of the best farms in this country. Local papers, radio, websites, Twitter, Facebook, and are other good ways to explain the care you take on your farm. The wall of trust is built one brick at a time. And every time someone has a positive experience with a British farmer, another brick is added to that wall. Now is the time to take advantage of the high regard for British farmers. But if you do speak in public about the events of the past few weeks, be careful about overclaiming. Remember, we don't have all of the testing um, results back and we don't have all of the evidence. If you pin all the problems on others, and then if an issue is found later in any British farm, it would be a dreadful own goal particularly at this time. And I think that the NFU has got the balance just about right. My final principle is to push for more supply chain integration, something that Peter talked about this morning. And by that I mean farmers in secure and lasting arrangements with their customers, involving plenty of dialogue and sharing information. This gives us more certainty in an uncertain world for consumers, retailers, manufacturers, food service operators, and farmers. At IGD, we always put the case for teamwork through the chain, but never has the need been more obvious, and never has the door been wider open. And right now, McDonald's will be very glad today that he decided a long time ago to set up dedicated supply groups. Many others have taken the same lead um, or are now taking the same course. But teamwork can also help to address another big challenge. Some people say that we'll all have to pay a lot more for our food in the future. If they're right, that would bring real hardship to a vast number of people at the worst possible time. And everybody deserves to have safe, high quality, affordable food. So if we are serious about putting consumers first, then we will need to have to work very hard indeed 
to minimize any extra costs. And the best way to do this is to work together, to look again at the chain from end to end, to find new ways to deliver for consumers as efficiently as possible. And over the last decade at IGD, we've had the opportunity to work on 33 supply chain projects doing exactly that. And what we found was, as a rule of thumb, that there's still 20% of costs in the average product chain which adds absolutely no value for consumers. The costs were there because of quality problems, practices that caused food waste, a lack of information sharing, distribution problems, poor forecasting, and I could go on. Everyone has made some really big strides, but by working together through integrated chains, I'm convinced that there's still scope to provide more of what shoppers want in a transparent way, efficiently, and above all, profitably for everyone involved. Throughout my entire career, I have felt proud and privileged to work in this great industry, the world's most important industry. And I've seen many tremendous advances in food safety, quality, variety, and value. I've met thousands of dedicated people working incredibly hard to deliver those improvements. I've traveled the world, and I know firsthand that British food standards are truly exceptional. So I do feel outraged that the actions of a few have tarnished the jewel of that reputation, and that reputation of so many good people. But something positive will come from this. The rogues will be rooted out, and the people of integrity will reap their just reward. Together we can, and we will rebuild consumer confidence. If we set our sights high, if we put consumers first, if we welcome transparency, if we make our voice heard, if we work as a team, then we can lift confidence to an all-time high. The future belongs to good farmers, to good growers, and to good people in good companies, working to high standards to provide great food for all of our consumers. I am confident we can emerge from this in stronger shape than ever before. Work together and seize the moment. Thank you very much, Joanne, for those very wise words. Uh, I, I still believe that if the Welsh rugby team eat plenty of lamb in the next fortnight, then we could have a shock on March the 16th. <laughs> But thank you for mentioning the national campaign which the National Farmers instigated last week. As you said, I think this is a great opportunity for farmers and for the whole supply chain. And you mentioned four words. You kept referring to four words. Confidence, trust, transparency, and the customer. And the NFU has also carried out a survey of not 12,000 shoppers, but 1,000 shoppers over the last fortnight. And again, the results are very, very similar to what you've highlighted where there is great confidence in the British farming industry. There's a lot of trust within the farming industry. And again, those British consumers wish to buy and source more British food and local provenance as well. And you did say that local butchers have benefited in the last fortnight. Slightly surprised, Mr. Norman Bagley. I didn't see too much emotion on your face when that was mentioned. But again, it's a good message for those local butchers. The reputation has to be repaired. And as you said, customers must be at the heart of our policies. And again, thank you for mentioning Open Farm Sunday, because again, this is a wonderful opportunity for us as farmers to welcome those customers, those shoppers, onto our farms to create that transparency going forward. So thank you, Joanne, for those very wise words. 
Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. John Cridland, CBE, Director General of the CBI. John is the key spokesman for the business community in the media, on public platforms and with the government. He leads the CBI, the voice of business in the UK and represents <coughs> British interests internationally. And John, I believe you've just come back from India on the trip with the Prime Minister. Delighted you're with us and as a National Farmers Union we are pleased to be an influential member of the CBI. Over to you, John. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, colleagues. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Rigg, for that very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you here today. Philip and Joanne have spoken eloquently and passionately about the food industry from farm to shop, about the reputational challenges that you're currently facing through no fault of your own. I'm not going to repeat those messages. I think they've been well made and well landed. I am going to talk about where farming fits in the broader question of delivering for our economy. My role, as Mayor Egg said, is to be the voice of business, and I'm passionate about the role we play, we play, in creating wealth, creating jobs, both for the benefit of all in our society. And I just want to stress the CBI that I lead speaks for all businesses, small as well as large, manufacturers as well as service businesses, farmers as well as retailers, in the country and in the town. And on all of my regional councils, of which I have 13 elected bodies around the country, made up of businessmen and businesswomen, leaders one and all, there's always at least one farmer speaking up for your interests and representing the interests of the NFU as leading businesses in this country. Easy thing for me to say, but just before I went to India with the Prime Minister, I spoke at the CBI Cumbria annual dinner with 200 businessmen and women on the shores of Lake Windermere. And that was a debate about growing the rural economy, about making sure that not all of Britain's economic growth was in the ancient Greek-style city-state we choose to call London, and a debate about access to finance, jobs and houses for young people, planning regulations, renewable energy, superfast broadband, the bread and butter issues of growing a business in Cumbria, and the bread and butter issues of your concerns. Earning a living, grinding growth in challenging times. And it's my role, the CBI's role, to speak up alongside our good friends at the NFU for your interests, because you are a business. Now, you might be wondering, to the extent I speak about farming, what are my credentials? Well, my generation of Cridlands is the first not to farm or be in agricultural engineering, maybe a sign of changing times. But my DNA still has 200 years of Lincolnshire small holding farming in it. Indeed, in 1856, the wheelwright and machine maker in the small village of Sibsey in Lincolnshire was a certain John Cridland. The other skill that DNA dealt me is a good understanding of the British weather, a core skill I know for all farmers. Which brings me to that famous quote from Mark Twain, who once wrote, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody ever does anything about it. <laughs> well, colleagues, it sometimes feels a bit that way about the economy, as well as the weather. Since, nine, since 2008, we talk endlessly about the economy, but it doesn't seem to get any better. Faltering growth, rising borrowing, Businesses that can't get loans, neighbours that can't buy a house, young people that can't get a job. It feels tough because it is tough. Indeed, I'm afraid to say, in my judgment, tough has become the new normal. But like the weather, things are actually rather better than they sometimes seem. 
I'm a glass half full sort of guy, tends to work in this job. I believe we are slowly but surely rebalancing our economy away from a decade of growth which entirely, key word entirely, depended on household and public consumption. Too much of it, as we now know, debt-driven. An economy where business investment and trade made exactly a zero contribution to net growth over the whole of a decade. Now, rebalancing from debt to investment is like detoxing. It's a painful process and it takes time. But I wanted to say today, mainly to cheer us all up, I can actually see signs of progress. Yes, we have a trade deficit, but that's unsurprising given the doldrums in the Eurozone and our trade to Europe is down 8% on the 2007 peak. But wait for the key fact. Our exports to emerging markets are 37% higher than they were in the second quarter of 2007, the last peak. As Mayor Rigg said, I saw this for myself last week when I joined the Prime Minister in India. It's worth repeating, 37% higher. I've heard Boris Johnson say, a fact too good to check. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this one happens to be true. <laughs> What other signs of encouragement? A labour market which despite flat growth and every labour economist said you can't grow jobs if there's no growth is growing jobs in our economy at record levels. And an economy which I sense is just on the turn. Nothing to get carried away about. Growth which at best will feel sluggish but growth nonetheless. The CBI surveys, my business surveys, show an uptick in business confidence about forward orders. And this is reflected in the PMIs, as you'll know, the Purchasing Managers Index for both manufacturing and for services. The global scene feels a little bit le less worrying. I wrote this before at least two comedians did well in the Italian elections. And most challenging of all for me to say in front of over a thousand people, I genuinely feel that the consumer, not all consumers, but many consumers, on the basis of three consecutive quarters of having a little more money in their pocket, is feeling a little bit more confident. Whether they'll spend that money or leave it under the mattress, time will tell. And as Ever the optimist, I see signs that credit could be coming more available to our small businesses, to you. The Bank of England's funding for lending scheme is having a positive effect. It's already visible in mortgage availability, and in coming months, I'm confident that we'll see more credit availability flowing through to more loans for small firms. So like the weather, we may talk a lot about the economy, but Mark Twain, hear this, we are doing something about it. What more can we do about it? And more especially, what can the government do about it? Well, there are no silver bullets here. We've all had to get used to a bit of belt tightening. But as far as I'm concerned, there are three things the government should do. I saw the Chancellor on Monday, sandwiched in between his TV interviews on losing the AAA sovereign rating and his appearance before the Parliamentary Commission on Banking. And I thought my job was tough. And I had one message for the Chancellor and three wishes on behalf of the business community. My message was tackle austerity but promote growth. And my three wishes were, first of all, I don't see any practicable alternative for Britain than paying down the deficit. I don't see that losing our credit rating changes that. I'd rather stick to the plan. I wouldn't go any faster, but I certainly wouldn't go any slower. Second, 
Chancellor, give real signals to the consumer and to Britain's small businesses that boost confidence, because at the moment, confidence is king. Now, to be fair to George, in December he did just that, as far as businesses are concerned, with a tenfold increase in the annual investment allowance, which I know is something the NFU asked for, and it's certainly something that I lobbied him on. A real boost for growing businesses on March the 20th, I think we could give a similar confidence boost to the consumer and the area I would choose forensically to have the same effect would be to invest in housing. What about a housing ISA to give people help with saving a deposit? What about extending mortgage, mortgage insurance indemnities to second steppers around the country, many of whom are suffering from negative equity? And what about a boost in funding for housing associations building affordable housing? And finally, I'd transfer more current spending to capital spending in our infrastructure. Money for local authorities to fill those winter snow potholes in our roads. Money to get super fast broadband into the peripheral rural areas. And money to support green energy generation. If the Chancellor can act in these ways, he's helping you help yourselves and help the communities we live in. The communities we live in. This brings me to my final point, and I hope links back to Philip and Joanne's very telling presentations. It's businesses like yours that will fill the gap left by a retreating state and left by constrained consumers. They need you. We were never more needed. But at a time when we've never been more needed, we've never been less trusted. And this attempt at a joke sometimes falls flat with a thousand people. There's bound to be one in the room who I upset. Business at the moment is just about as popular as estate agents. <laughs> and it's not just because of the banks. And it's not just because of multinational companies, albeit that small businesses are more popular and that most of us say we have a higher regard for the business we work for than we have for businesses as a whole. But I concur with the comments that Joanne made. No company, no business is an island. We swim together or we sink together. CBI spends a lot of time, like the IGD, like Tesco's, talking to customers, talking to citizens. And one thing I think comes across very tellingly. If you talk to citizens about their views of us as businesses, they respond as consumers. They judge business on how they have been served. They're not always impressed by the services they've had in the last few years from banks. They're not always impressed by what they get from utilities. They generally have a higher view of manufacturers, and allow me to say, because it's true in our polling, they have a particularly high view of retailers and supermarkets. There's an important message here, I think, for all of us. If we want to be trusted, we have to ensure that the core thing we do, not the corporate social responsibility, not the charity giving, the core thing we do delivers for our consumers and our communities. And that's as near as you're going to get me to comment on horse meat. <laughs> now, when I think about delivering for consumers and communities, I genuinely say, not because I'm facing a thousand of you, I can't think of anybody who does that in Britain better than farmers. And I'm intensely proud to have farmers as part of Britain's business community and to speak for you as part of Britain's business voice. Thank you for your patience. Can I say th thank you again, John, for some very wise words. 
You say the CBI speaks up for all businesses, big and small, and again, we thank you for the opportunity to be involved in your councils around the regions, because your regions fit into the NFU regions quite nicely. So again, thank you for that opportunity. You discussed all the economic challenges that we face, but the one thing I am certain of, farmers and growers can help to deliver in these uncertain times and help to fill that gap that will be left by the reduction in the public sector. You mentioned exports up 37%. Delighted to say that food and drink has helped in these figures, and long may that continue as well. You touched on the two comedians in the Italian elections in the last few days. I think they've definitely come to the Chancellor's saving grace, because just when we lost our triple A rating, the pound started slipping against the euro. It was good news for farming. But these two comedians have come to the sort of saving grace of the Chancellor because I see the pound has strengthened against the Euro since those Italian elections. But we can promote growth and some of those fiscal policies that you talk about. And thank you again for your support in the annual machinery allowance improvement last at the budget. Great news, but please, if you can convince the Chancellor to extend that to buildings, infrastructure, water infrastructure in particular, then again, it will help to stimulate growth and demand. And again, a lot of that money would be circulated into the local communities or those given areas. So thank you for those very wise words. And now I'm going to open up to question time. The clock is ticking, so if you could be fairly sort of sharp. With your questions, please, there are microphones and there will be two roving microphones on the sort of balconies, I believe. So can I first of all ask Mr. Phil Abbott and Mr. Rob Harrison to make your way to the mics. Phil. Thank you, Myrick. Uh, my question is to Philip Clark of Tesco. Firstly, thank you very much, Mr. Clark, for a very enthusiastic uh, presentation, and I think it will inspire some confidence within the industry. Thank you, it's what we need. But I've got a question here. As a result of Orsgate, there are now more potential for more regulation, more auditing, more testing than alter, that ultimately generates cost within the supply chain. Will Tesco's statement that the consumer will not be charged more, what reassurances are there that any extra cost will not fall back on farmers as Tesco works to reassure the public of its food safety and provenance? Please remember, we farmers still have our integrity intact within the supply chain, which is more, that can, more than can be said for some people. Thank you, Phil. And Robert Harrison, please. Is, Rob, is Robert Harrison here? No? No? Well, I'll put the question that Rob Harrison put forward. And again, it's to you, Philip. In light of the horse gate for Rory, across the retail sector, now is a fantastic time for you to commit to British farmers on the red tractor, and by doing so, regain some of the lost trust from your customers. Can we get your commitment today that Tesco will re-examine supply chain to maximise those opportunities to buy British? I know you've touched on a lot of that earlier in your speech, but could you pick up those two questions, please, Phil? Of course, Mary. Um well, there is great potential, Phil, for more auditing, for more cost. But we've got to avoid that at all cost. Consumers don't need to pay a price for a few indiscretions by a few unscrupulous people in some far-off places, and nor should farmers. What I've done today is extend, that, extend the hand of uh, a partnership. We're going to work to make sure that by buying more closer to home, we can eliminate the costs that inevitably are put in place because you're buying longer. And I hope that that means all of us can make a profit and consumers can benefit. It won't be an easy thing to do. None of these things are. But I'm here sincerely to say that's our objective. I know it's your objective. I think working with the NFU, with farmers and with processors, it should be possible to achieve. Do you want to come back, Phil? Yes, please, if you don't mind. What we want is a sustainable beef industry out there. We want Tesco to so we can grow our business to supply you with the product that you want. We are good at doing that. But if you're going to have these specialist boards and such things in place, which I agree with, 
So I think Marie might have his CV on the way there, but looking at it, I suppose. <laughs> but I've got the qualifications for yeah. <laughs> He's never, never miss an opportunity. Well done, Marie. But what, oh, I, oh, what I'm, what I'm saying is... Off now if you want. What <laughs> I'm saying is that cost cannot come back to us. We're not making that, no money out of the system as it is at the moment. And if that cost comes back onto us, you won't have a beef, sheep or pork producer or chicken farmer out there who will be sustainable to supply you with that product. Thank you very much. Well, well, I suppose my, my thank you again, Phil. My my answer comes from the lips of Rob, you know, who said, "Isn't it a fantastic time to commit to British farming?" You've got my commitment to that. It won't be easy to do. It will take time to do it, but we're committed to it. And, and Red Tractor was mentioned by Rob as well. I think one goes with the other, doesn't thank it? You. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat> Now I'm going to call on Duncan Priestner and David Brooks, please. Duncan, Hello. Chairman of our Poultry Board. Yeah. Duncan, Duncan Priestner, uh, NFU Poultry Board Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Philip, for uh, announcing your commitment to sourcing 100% British chicken. Uh, poultry farmers and the supply chain have in invested heavily to improve efficiencies. However, we continue to see our margins eroded. Tesco are committing to buy and use more British chicken, and you state you're also willing to commit to moving away from short-term contracts and tenders and show longer-term commitments to suppliers. But most importantly, are you going to commit to paying a fair price, especially when you say the price of your food won't go up? Thank you, Duncan. And David, please. Thank you. Um, I think we've had some encouraging messages from Mr. Clark today and I think there isn't a member of the NFU or anybody in the agricultural industry who doesn't appreciate what's actually been said and I think they certainly need applauding. As you say, every little helps. <laughs> Indeed, Mr. Clark, every item that goes through your tills has your full cost recovered from each sale. Yet the continued aggressive discounting by retailers is making food production uneconomic and putting at risk the British family farm. I know I've mentioned that earlier. Potentially destroying the British countryside as we know it. Fresh milk is now sold at less than a third of its value of 40 years ago, and how much further and how much longer a retailer is going to discount such a valuable food resource, yet hiding behind a small number of dedicated direct suppliers with your cost of production formula, and sourcing the bulk of your supply at well below that cost of production. Is Is it not now time you returned a little bit more to all of your farms? You've made some wonderful gestures today. Do you recognise that the only supply chain that works is one where everyone makes a margin? And are you going to extend that proposed, proposed partnerships, especially with all of your supplying dairy farmers? Thank you, David. Philip. I think there was. You, a did lot you of say things. the lion's den? Is that what you said? <laughs> I thought you were like, you were like David. You've done exceedingly well. <laughs> uh, well, um, I think there's there's one answer that I think will you know suit both of the questions really. Um, if I if I just stand back and think about what's happened in in the industry for many years, um, and particularly in the last five, when you know the world changed, 2007, 8, the financial crisis. Consumers have been in, you know, in recession as we all have. So price has become more important, much more important. And um, that's led to very aggressive discounting, as you said, particularly of some staples. But um, I can recognize that that isn't sustainable because every part of the supply chain needs to make a return. Because if it doesn't, the supply chain will break. We started with the Tesco Sustainable Dairy Group for our liquid milk. 
and that's been very successful. And today I've committed to extending that to more protein sources, and I think ultimately, you know, to fruits and to vegetables and to salads. But retailing isn't just about price, and anybody who just goes on price ends up in one place. Thin margins, short contracts, lots of tendering, no relationships. And I stood over there before and said, this is about a partnership, about new transparency, about longer relationships. But for consumers, they still want something. They want value. And the, the definition of value is different for all of us. It's that unique combination of price and quality and range and service you know, in the right environment. So there are customers who are going to want to buy very cheap food. I hope that working together, we can make sure more of it's British and the people who are involved in it can make a return at every stage in the chain. Every stage in the chain. Actually, that is what Every Little Helps meant. You know, it wasn't Every Little Helps Tesco. <laughs> it was Tesco, Every Little Helps. And I'm going to make sure that's the way it is. And it will take me time to do. But I'm going to do it. And of course, Duncan, that means short-term contracts and tenders and loss-making <coughs> producers don't sustain the supply chain. So today, we commit to a change. Change takes time. Sometimes it's painful. It's going to be a journey. We started it a few months ago with beef and with pork, and we'll continue it. And with your help, we'll make it a success. Thank you for that, Philip. <clears throat> Can I also say that one or two of the sort of fresh veg producers, the potato growers, and horticulturalists sort of asked me as well earlier mm. whether well, eventually this can roll out into that sector as well. And I picked up your commitments earlier, so again. Okay. Uh, we'll move on then to Mike Hamley, please, and Steve Connonsby. And then we'll have Mark Leggett and Nigel Joyce for the next two questions, if you prepare yourselves. <coughs> so, Mike. Thank you, Morik. Farmers have worked very hard and spent enormous sums of money to establish and maintain robust farm assurance standards based on food safety, but often with sound environmental credentials and connected right through to retail packs with the red tractor logo. Is now really the right time for UK retailers to be removing red tractor logos from their products? Thank you, Mike. I think these questions are for you, Joanne. And Mr. Steve Connorsby, please. East livestock producer and also small independent meat retailer. My question is to Joanna. Why did it take so long for the retailers and processors before they actually came out and made a comment on the horse meat? And also, will there ever be a place for correctly labelled horse meat on shelves if there is traceability? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll take sure. it in reverse order then. Just, um, a, there's a lot of people actually have stopped me in the corridors today to say, you know, why didn't people come out earlier? And I think that there's a, a big difference between the perception um, and the reality. I think where I sit, sort of at the heart of the food chain, um, perhaps I have a bit more visibility than some people, but to be honest, um, whether it was food retailers, whether it was food manufacturers, whether it was uh, food service operators, when people actually found something, they actually faced into it and were genuinely very open, honest, and transparent because, I'll come back to my point of earlier, which is we all have to have customers or consumers at the heart of everything we do. Um, and therefore, if you have a good look at the history and the trail, what you will see are loads of advertisements in the papers. What you'll see is use of blogs, videos, YouTube, individual letters to customers who were on their, their databases. So they, I believe that 
across the industry, people did a lot. However, I think there was a little pause, and rightly so, between the point at which we went into very rigorous testing and getting the first set of results. Because once everybody would come out and been honest and open about what they'd found, they then obviously wanted to wait for the results to say something. And I think, in a way, it, it's been a bit unfortunate that, if I can be quite frank, that some of the um, opinion formers um, were, I think, unfair to the industry because people were waiting for results so they could have something to say. So I think there is genuinely um, a very big gap between the perception and what actually happened. And, and incidentally, I did do a little piece of analysis um, for the government on that to say that I felt that they had actually been rather harsh. So I, I hopefully I speak with some authority on that, having actually had a look at what had been done. But I think it's a really important point. Um, the second thing on Red Tractor, I think whether it's, I think it's up to the individual companies to decide what they want to do. Um, but that having been said, I'd like to make two points. The first on the red tractor, you've got a really strong basis and bedrock on which to build. So I guess if I were in your position, I'd be pushing hard to, to up the communication on that and make sure that you're using language that shoppers actually understand and that you get your stories across. And if some companies choose not to do that, then you need to accept that as long as they're getting your messages across in a very positive ways, which extols the benefits um, of British food, then frankly, from a shopper's point of view, I believe that suffices. So I think you've got two options there. Thank you, Joan. Now there are two questions for Mr. John Quidland. Mr. Nigel Joyce first, then, and then Mark Leggett. Uh, Mr. <coughs> President, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, it, is, it is for John Quidland. But being a Norfolk poultry farmer, it would be an opportunity wasted if I couldn't just have half a minute making a point to Mr. Clark also. I applaud your comments, sir. Uh, I take them on board wholeheartedly because within our business we operate at very high standards also. I offer my hand to you as a hand of partnership to build a relationship because relationships with supermarkets is something I've never, ever heard of before. <laughs> I certainly hope that some of your competitors are sitting in the audience today and that they will take on board your comments and uh, will, um, will follow your lead. Um, because I have been, my business has been affected only minutely, admittedly, by the Morrison's Hemsley affair which leaves a horrible taste in my mouth. But sir, my question to uh, Mr. Cridland. The UK agricultural productivity has stagnated in recent years, whilst other countries like the US, Argentina, and even Spain have seen their farm productivity grow. Whether it's application of new technologies, management techniques, or investment in R&D, what can UK farmers learn from other business sectors in terms of closing this productivity gap? Thank you, Nigel. And Mark Leggett, please. Again to John Quidland. Uh, thank you. Firstly, greetings to John from one old Bostonian to another. I do know where Sibs is. Um, John, you mentioned in your address what more the government can do to aid consumers and community. My question concerns what more do you believe the government should be doing to ensure that our manufacturing base, including agriculture, remains competitive and can go on to future growth and prosperity? Thank you, Mark. John? Okay, thank you, Merrick. <coughs> Let me take them in reverse order, because I think I can come to the productivity point <coughs> with a word first about the wider issues on manufacturing. I spent most of last year talking in Parliament to MPs about the need for Britain to have a 21st century industrial policy. And I saw a real shift in opinion during that calendar year, because at the beginning of the year, if I talked about industrial policy, people thought it was time I edged towards retirement, because they thought I was talking about British Leyland in the 1970s, 
and Red Robbo. There's a lot of baggage <coughs> around getting behind British industry and British manufacturing. We've got a lot of politicians with burnt fingers who believe the only job to do is set the market rules and let business get on with it. But although I'm passionately pro-free market, I never claim that markets are perfect. There are lots of things government need to do. Philip and Joanne talked about some of them in the regulation area. I'm talking about some of the nurturing and encouraging and facilitating where government can help business be successful. And a 21st century industrial strategy, I think, is about getting behind the sectors where we stand a chance of being world class and government identifying the things that are needed, sometimes only at the margin, but continuous improvements all about doing the things at the margin, which help take us on the right journey. Let me illustrate it with one example. Look at British automotive. Five years ago, at the worst moment of the recession, it was on its knees. We had shutdowns, short working in most of our car factories. Now it's leading that export-led revolution. You take a company like Jaguar Land Rover, Indian-owned, German chief executive, British engineering, British workforce productivity, hoovering up the Chinese market with Jaguar Land Rovers. That's what can happen if an industry gets together. And I think there is important cross lessons between different industries here on supply chains. Because what the automotive industry is doing is what Philip and Joanne talked about. They're bringing production back. They're bringing supply chains back. They're localizing their supply chains to strengthen in depth their industry. Now, automotive gets talked about quite a lot because ministers like to sit in fast cars and Jaguar is all over the place. And good luck to them. But the food and drink industry is Britain's biggest manufacturing sector and one of our very best. So we don't need to take too many lessons from the sexy industries. You can do it too. Let me come then to the question on productivity. I'm very interested in that. I didn't actually know those figures, current figures, were <coughs> as they are. Forgive me. I see fantastic increases in productivity in British agriculture. I come, as the speaker said, the last speaker, from Boston in Lincolnshire. So I come from the richest agricultural land in the country, where farms, <laughs> double pun, farms have typically been smaller, although that's changing over the years, because the land can produce so much crop. And I've seen farms which, when I was a boy, had 20 people working on them, now delivering twice the yield with two men or women working on them. And you know what I'm talking about. We have seen fantastic improvements in agricultural productivity. It's why it's no longer as labor intensive as it used to be, but twice as successful. Can it go further? I'm very interested in the examples from other countries. Well, productivity is a continuous game of improvement. You never, ever stop. And of course, there are lessons to learn. But one of the things that I think we've got to get away from is the narrow definition of productivity. The narrow definition of a productivity is output per man or woman. I don't think that's a very good definition of productivity because it means if Philip takes on more staff to deliver a better service to the customer by having more people on checkout tills, that some chinless wonder analyst in the city will say his productivity's gone down when his customer satisfaction goes up. And I'd say the same about agriculture. Total productivity isn't just a case of the numbers of people working on a farm. It's about how you work a farm. Thank you, John. There's lots and lots of questions here. <clears throat> I'm going to take four more. If I could have two, first of all, Stephen James and Roger Jenkins, please. And there are two, Philip Clark, and then we could have Martin Humphreys and Tom Rigby standing by. So Stephen and Roger. So 
Thank you, Mike. That sounds a bit cool. It's working, Thank, Stephen. Yeah. Thank you, Marig. Um, I, uh, my question is to Philip Clark. I represent, I'm the Deputy President of uh, NFU Cymru, the NFU in Wales. Uh, we first of all thank you, Tesco, for underwriting the, uh, um, the, the beef price and, and lamb price into St. Marion so that one, uh, now that Vi Vion want to sell it, that uh, it, it's, it's a viable proposition to, um, to be bought by, by, by somebody. And we, uh, we applaud what you've announced last uh, autumn, uh, the direct contracts with beef and sheep. Now, uh, this question was before your announcement today, but so I assume that it works for lamb as well, because in Wales uh, we've witnessed the perfect storm in, in, uh, in the lamb trade, where uh, uh, some, you know, the cost of last summer has meant that uh, costs have risen, and global and uh, domestic uh, price falls has meant that the product is 30 or 40 pound less a lamb at the moment. So sheep incomes are down by half in Wales at the moment. And my question is twofold. The commitments you've made this morning, I trust, is for lamb uh, as well, and uh, uh, we'd hope that those, those uh, will extend to lamb producers. And uh, being, as I'm from Wales, and, and the product uh, Welsh lamb is renowned throughout the world with its PGI status, so we assume that Welsh lamb will be most certainly part of, of that commitment. And uh, of course, secondly, uh, again, I trust that now that you've made this commitment today that uh, uh, lamb will be on, on the Tesco shelves for 12 months of the year as opposed to be a, a seasonal product. So those are my two questions. Thank you, Stephen. It's two questions in one. And Roger, please. <coughs> Roger Jenkin, uh, Cornwall Vice Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clark, I'd like to congratulate you on running such a successful business. I'm sure that most people in this room have the same aspirations. As a retailer, you are lucky to be able to increase your margins by squeezing processors and producers. As a, <coughs> as a farmer, I don't have that luxury. Despite continual efficiency drives, I am running out of options to reduce my further, further my costs. Meanwhile, meanwhile, your margin from liquid milk has increased from 3 pence a litre in the 90s to 26 pence a litre today. Could you explain to conference what Tesco does to deserve an eight-fold increase in margin? Well, I continue to work seven days a week my margin has remained static at best, and I continue to make a loss. Please, Mr. Clark, don't hide behind the 700 farmers in the Tesco Milk Supply Group. Tesco market 30% of the dairy, farmer, dairy products in this country, if you include cream, butter, and not least cheese. Maybe we could start by dividing your, your share of the retail market, or your share of, the mar of our market, the 26 pence by three, giving you a third, the consumer a third, and the dairy farmer a third. Let's start the journey together. Thank you, Archie. <laughs> Could we have Tom Rigby and Martin Humphrey standing by? I'm going to leave this one on for 10 minutes. I'm over time, but the breakout sessions don't start to fall. So, Phil, please, if you could just respond to <coughs> lamb and, again, to milk products more than the liquid milk. Well, um, you get to the, Roger, you get really to the heart of commerce, don't you? And, um, you know, I'm very proud to lead Tesco. It's uh, the third biggest retailer in the world. But, you know, if we were sat here 25 years ago, we were the third biggest retailer in the UK. Didn't have many stores in Scotland. We didn't own a bank. Uh, we didn't have a loyalty card with 16 million people carrying it. We hadn't invested the thick end of 20 billion pounds in building out the UK business, and another 10 billion pounds building out market-leading businesses in Thailand, and in Malaysia, and in Korea, and Hungary, and Poland, and having businesses in China and, and in India. I'm going to China uh, straight after this. So the reason that Tesco has done well is because, like you, it's had to invest. And it's invested a lot. And it's built a brand. It's built a set of competencies. I shouldn't be the guy saying this. I'd much rather say it. You know, we are the business uh, that is the benchmark for many in our industry. And we're a British business, ran by British people. 
but with a lot of other people around the world who do it the way we do it. Now, I know that for people right at the sharp end of the supply chain, right in the farms, it's never easy. You've got to deal with all manner of things. Look at the torrid time you've had with uh, rains over the last few months. You're so <coughs> dependent on the climate. You see consumers retrenching. You see retailers scratching to preserve their share. You see competition. You see all that. But that's the heart of commerce, you know, in the end. That's the way it all works. So um, it's never as easy as a third, a third, a third. You know that, and I know that. And I'm not hiding behind anything. The way to hide is not to come here. The way to hide, you know, is to be somewhere else. I'm here because I'm extending the hand of partnership. I don't know where it will end up, but it's sincere. I'm not hiding. I said that I would start with chicken because you know it's the quickest and easiest. And I said that we would move with your help and with your support and in dialogue with you to other protein types. So we will. And I don't know where it will lead, but I do know it'll be good for you, it'll be good for us, and it'll be good for consumers. Sounds like rhetoric, I know, but it's sincere and it's honest. Um, for all of that investment, by the way, in, uh, in UK retail, we'll make 5.2 pence in the pound. If you look at that in terms of the return on the invested capital, you know, the company makes about 11% return after 90 years of hard graft. So um, the 519,000 people who work for Tesco, um, you know, they, they put their heart and soul into this. <coughs> and they hear people always saying, big, bad Tesco. Well, you know, you can tell I'm a bit sick of that. Um, but it's not big, bad Tesco. It's big, successful Tesco wanting to extend the hand of partnership. I can do no more than promise you that right now. I promise you right now. Um, and in terms of lamb, of course, we want to explore how to make sure that we can do the same with lamb. It's a bit more difficult, as you know, um, in fact, it's a lot more difficult, and I'm not going to go into the reasons for that, but I think, Stephen, you know it as well as I. Global markets, common markets, single markets, strength of New Zealand, and all that. All of our finest, finest lamb is British. We should work to make sure it's on the shelves more often. And that's going to require us to do an awful lot of work and an awful lot of research, and we probably ought to commit to getting on with that pretty quickly. Thank you, and I know there's 2,000 lambs, if you wish, in the next six weeks as well. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we now... Uh, is Martin... Martin Humphreys, please, and Tom Rigby. And Tom, I can see Tom at the microphone. Um, or Mart, sorry, Martin, I can see on the top. Yes. Uh, firstly, to congratulate you, Philip. Um, thank you for not hiding. I'd like to congratulate you for setting the date when, metaphorically, you're going to stop beating your wife. And... <laughs> that you're going to buy British chicken. That's something everyone in this room knows. And everyone wants you to buy British. Please pay the best price. At the end of the comment, now a question. This question concerns GM, specifically Tesco's insistence of using non-GM soya, even though some of the other ingredients in the feed, that non-GM feed, are actually GM. This year's Brazilian soy harvest will not yield sufficient non-GM soya to satisfy the small demand from Europe and from UK retailers. In short, we're going to run out. How can we, as farmers and the supply chain, help your business to explain to your customers that there's not enough non-GM soya and that GM needs to be used in the feed and in the supply chain? Thank you, Martin. And Tom, again, on GM. The same question that was put to the Minister this morning, but he, he said it was a retailer's responsibility rather than his. Uh, but Philip, you said if it's not on, in the label, it's not in the packet. Does that include the GM content of imported maize and soya used in the products on your shelves? And do you think your rivals are equally as conscientious? Thank you, Tom. The questions are getting more difficult, aren't they? <laughs> I can assure you that the last two. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, well, I, mean, the, the, I don't know what the minister said. I'm, I'm sorry I was driving up here. Um, but I think the regulations are pretty clear, aren't they? Um, and we confirm, conform to the regulations, which are, um, if there's more than 1% of GM ingredients in the packet, it has to be on the label. So if, if it's a Tesco branded product, and that is the case, then it does. I'm not sure that we've got any, but I'll ask somebody and we'll let you know. But I'm pretty sure we don't. And I, I'm sure that's the law. And a team of people here from Tesco, who, if I've just got that wrong, will tell me as soon as I leave the stage. <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to, uh, to Martin. I'm probably already tweeting it as it happens. <laughs> to, to Martin, um, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? Um, and we know that you are right, that the time is coming, that it's very, very difficult for us to secure enough GM free soya. Uh, and so we're pondering exactly what to do at the moment. There, there's an enormous group, maybe it's a small group of very vocal people who want to argue against it continually. And so, you know, it's right at the top of our agenda, something we'll have to address pretty shortly. We could do with your help. Don't know how you help, but um, my team are here. Maybe you can give us some help. Thank you. We'll take you up on that offer, Philip. Can I apologize to those other people that have put questions forward? There's an awful lot still here, but I've left the session overrun by 15 minutes, so you're going to have a very short coffee break. I'm sorry. But can I, on behalf of all of us, thank Philip, Joanne, and John for a most fascinating session I think it's been most interesting and opportune as well at this given time. I think we have actually laid down a foundation to deliver a new partnership going forward, I honestly do, where we're going to, have to see more transparency, less complex supply chains, and hopefully we can help build that relationship right across those supply chains, right through to that shopper customer, which is going to be so important. We've got to bring those supply chains back closer to home, as John has said. I did like the comment, I think Joanne used it and John used it, that farming can be sexy. I think a lot of us will agree with that. But I think the most, <laughs> I think the most important message out of today, and again, I thank you, Philip, for coming along at this difficult period, but it's to extend your hand for further commitment to build those partnerships. We must look forward, and I believe <coughs> together we can actually enhance benefit of consumers, retailers, processors, and us as farmers. And I can give you a commitment, Philip, that we, as an NFU, will be glad to work in the months ahead to rebuild that trust and that confidence and improve those supply chains. So thank you all very much. This coffee, tea, and the breakout sessions, I believe, are starting at 4 o'clock. And can I also say to you, when it comes to the drink reception and the dinner this evening, you must bring your security passes, otherwise you won't be allowed in. Thank you very much for all your attendance.